Hebrews, I'm going to start in verse 8. The first seven verses say what we've been saying for the last three chapters, basically, that the new covenant that Jesus bought with his blood is superior to the old covenant, and particularly uh, we've been talking about the idea that his sacrifice is better, and we talked about a lot of reasons why his sacrifice was better than animal sacrifice, bulls and goats. And his uh, the priesthood is better. He's a perfect, never-ending priesthood. He'll never die. So, you know, his priesthood stands forever, and he has the perfect sacrifice. So all of those things are kind of recounted, repeated in verses 1 through 7. But beginning in verse 8, and we're going to try to go down to verse 39, there's a lot of very strong statements that the writer makes. Uh, some of them very positive and encouraging, some of them not so positive and encouraging, but all of them very strongly made. So uh, we're going to take just a few verses at a time. First, 8 through 10. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So he hits the two big highlights there at the end. We've been made uh, holy once and for all and by the body of Jesus Christ. So the perfect sacrifice brings the perfect results uh, once and for all. I thought the, the thing that's uh, interesting to me in that little <coughs> snippet is that we've been made holy. What does it mean to be holy? Cleansed from sin. Cleansed from sin. Okay, the idea of being away from sin, out of sin. What else? In the process of being made uh, free from sin, we're set apart. The idea that we are special, that we belong to God. We have a special purpose for our existence when we're made holy. Uh, Paul puts it this way in, in his writings. He says, there's some things in the house that are for common use, and there's some things in the house that are for holy use, special use. They're set aside for you know, particular things. Uh, we have a cabinet in our house that belonged to Becky's grandmother, and inside the cabinet are dishes that are special dishes, and we rarely bring them out. And we laugh about it because they're not necessarily really high dollar. They're just special. So we don't use those for any and every occasion. In fact, we've gotten to the place now where we do a whole lot of paper plates, uh, so the gr and the girls do the dishes, right? You, I'm sitting on the couch going, Elena, while you're up, could you just throw that in the, in the garbage? But uh, we've been made holy, but not only have we been made holy, we've been made holy once for all. Right? So part of that has to do with duration. Uh, we've been made holy and we remain holy. It was a one-time thing. The other part of that has to do with comparing to the old law and the old sacrifices. He made that sacrifice one time for all time. He doesn't have to be re-sacrificed over and over through the ages. So the thing that made us holy is always present. It never goes away. It never changes. So our holiness doesn't change because his sacrifice doesn't change. It's not completely based on who we are or what we can accomplish, but the fact that we've been bought by his blood makes us holy, and that holiness is a once-for-all kind of holiness because his sacrifice is a once-for-all kind of sacrifice. Now look at verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties, Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstools. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 
So he brings back in the idea of our holiness, but he adds another word to it. He says, we have been made perfect. Now, if I haven't ground this into you enough, what does that word perfect mean? It's the Greek word telos. It means complete. Right? We, there, there's nothing left. There's nothing lacking. Uh, in the old law, there was always something more. There was always another sacrifice. You were always almost now we're, we're never almost anymore. We've been made perfect. We've been made complete because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And there's an interesting little nuance here, and I, I don't know if I'm overstating the case, but he says in verse 12, when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, most of scripture, when we see Jesus at God's right hand, we see him seated. He takes his place in the throne at the right hand of God. He even promises the Ephesian church, the one who is faithful unto death, I will give a crown of life and I'll let you sit down with me in my throne like I have sat down with my father in his throne. So it's a place of permanence. It's a place of uh, prominence. You know, he belongs there because of who he is. But what about the idea of him sitting down? Does it have anything to do, if you go all the way back to chapter 4, when we were talking about entering into God's rest, right? If you're faithful, you enter into the rest. God rested from all the things that he had created on day 7, and then he invited Israel to enter into his rest, and they didn't get it done. So they're... There remains, therefore, a rest for the children of God. And then Jesus finishes his sacrifice, and he sits down. Like I said, I don't know if I'm overstating the case, but Jesus did all of his creative work, like his father did all of his creative work, and then rests from his work. He doesn't have to do any more sacrificing. There's nothing else for Jesus to do on our behalf. He's already done it all. So he sits down in that place of authority at the right hand of the Father. Um, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So those who are being separated out, those who are being given forgiveness, that group in which you and I find ourselves, all of those things are because Jesus has finished everything he was sent to do. Remember one of the things he says from the cross is, it is finished. I did everything you sent me to do. Uh, verses 15 through 18. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sins is no longer necessary. That's the way the newest translation, the NIV, reads. There is no longer, uh, uh, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Um, Cotty, what does the King James have there? Says there is no longer an offering for sin. There's no longer any offering for sin. Uh, New American Standard, I think, has no longer any sacrifice for sin. But this is the good news. Right? Now, later on, we're going to see almost the same phrase, uh, but it's bad news. In this place, it means since we're being forgiven and everything is in place for our forgiveness, there is no more sacrifice necessary. So, again, Jesus has completed his mission, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and everything is taken care of. Everything that needs to be done for our salvation has been done. So then we get to 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with all the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. So again, a very positive response called for uh, to all the things that Jesus has done. But notice a couple of these nuances again. Uh, we have been given confidence to enter the most holy place. When we started talking about the most holy place, we were talking about the high priest. How many days out of the year could he go in there? Just one time, right? Just one day out of the year was the only day he could go. He had to go in there with sacrificial blood. He would enter one day of the year with the blood of bulls and goats, he would go in and sprinkle the bull's blood, you know, seven times up and seven times down. And he would go back out and mix the blood of the bull and the goat together and seven times up and seven times down. Here the writer says, you can go boldly into the most holy place. You can go right in there where God is. You don't have to be a high priest. Uh, you don't have to be carrying special blood. Because Jesus has opened the way through the curtain that is his body. And that's an amazing picture for me. That Jesus has become this segue, this go through, so that we can go from being an earthly person in Christ into the Holy of Holies. So we can be in the very presence of God. So when we're in prayer... We deserve to be there, not because we've accomplished something, but because Jesus bought the right for us. We have the right to be where Jesus has purchased for us the right to be. So we're able to go in before God because of Jesus' body. Uh, you remember when he was dying on the cross, the, the curtain in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. So all of a sudden, there's this horrible thing that happens as far as a Jew is concerned, there's this opening, and if anybody tried to go through that opening, for them, it would have been death. But for us, it's life. It's access. It's coming before the Father. And Paul again uses the phrase, uh, we've been taught to call him Abba Father. We've not been given a spirit of fear. We've been given a spirit that cries out, Abba Father. Right? It, this, this connection to God that's been given to us through the blood of Jesus that we can go right into his presence is not something to be taken lightly. It's an amazing thing. Uh, and we can go in there with all the full assurance that faith brings. And he's beginning to kind of move in that direction. We're going to get to chapter 11. Um, probably next week we'll be able to start at least talking about that roll call of the faithful. All of those people throughout Jewish history that were faithful. And so the Hebrew writer just lists them out one after another. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Moses did this. By faith, Noah did that. So uh, we'll get to that. But he's beginning to kind of build up to it. We've had our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And we've had our bodies washed with pure water. Now, being a church Christ preacher, uh, I immediately want to go to baptism. Uh, unfortunately, in this passage... The references are to Old Testament worship, what they did to prepare a place to go into the Holy Foot, to wash the things that were necessary for uh, temple worship. Uh, can you imagine after they've had all of that blood, what do you do with that basin? Right? You've got to really cleanse that basin before you use it again. Right? It's not a common thing, it's a holy thing, so you've got to really make sure that it's cleansed. Well, we've been cleansed. And he mentions, he uses two different words here. Neither one of them are, are baptisma or bab, baptized. He says, we've had our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Uh, the first word there is rantizo, to sprinkle. And the second one is luo, to wash. So there's a, there's a, a hint toward what we've done, right? We've been washed, we've been purified, we've been sanctified. But the words that he chooses to use there uh, are not particular to baptism, but to the idea of being cleansed. Um, 
Let's hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. He who promised is faithful. And let us consider, this is verse 24, how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. What can I do to help you be more excited about your faith? As opposed to, what might I do in my life that would be undoing to your faith? Right? Am I building the people up around me to help them be more faithful? Or am I living a life that's somehow going to let the air out of their spiritual tires? So spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And he connects that to this passage on meeting together. Don't give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So at, at least in part, one of the things we do to encourage each other is getting together, showing up. Just the sheer presence of a group of people who are singing songs because they believe the same things, who are praying prayers because they believe the same things, um, who are studying scripture together. Uh, all of those things are encouraging to us. And so as, as we are more encouraged, our faith grows. Uh, evidently, there were some who were in that group that were beginning to fade because of unbelief. And we've talked about it several times. The reason that the Hebrew writer wrote this letter is there's a persecution that has broken out. And some of the Christians feel like, if I just go back to being Jewish, right, if, if I'm just Jewish, I'll have less run-ins, I'll have less problems than if I'm a Jewish Christian. So they're just kind of falling back to the old law. So he has spent the first uh, ten and a half chapters reminding us that there's no comparison between our relationship with Christ and that relationship to the old law. The old law is just not good enough. Uh, in the early chapters we looked at uh, Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than Moses, better than Aaron. His covenant is better than the old covenant. His sacrifice is better. The high priesthood is better. Everything's better. Why would you go back? So the group that he's talking to here is that same group. Don't stop meeting together, but encourage each other. Right? Don't let your, you know, uh, friends don't let friends Stop loving God. Friends don't let friends lose their faith. Uh, keep encouraging others. Verse 26, one of the most uh, strongly worded passages in the letter to Hebrews. And it begins with, if we deliberately keep on sinning. And there's two interesting phrases there. One is deliberately, and the other is keep on sinning. Does the, in a, does the King James have the word deliberately in it? It just willfully. says, if we willfully, okay, we sin willfully. if we sin willfully, uh, the the translation is correct on keep on sinning. This is not a one time thing. This is a lifestyle we're talking about. If we just go on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. And again, that's very similar to what we saw in eighteen. In eighteen. Jesus has done everything he needs to do. The sacrifice has been made. So where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sins is no longer necessary. So that's a good thing. But only a few verses later, he says, if we keep on sinning after we receive a knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. That's a bad thing. There is a sense in which we've offered you everything we have to offer. What else can what else is there? There's no other sacrifice. You can't just go back to the bulls and goats. There's not going to be another Messiah show up and make another sacrifice for you. Jesus has done his. He's not coming back to earth to be re-sacrificed for you. There's one sacrifice. Either you accept and have faith in that sacrifice or you don't. That's, that's the, the entire program that God has given for us. So no sacrifice for sins is left is a terrible thing, and he gives a list of things that go along with that. If you just go on back to living a life of sin, after you've received a knowledge of the truth, and you've given up on the sacrifice for sins that was available to you, 
uh, verse 27, there's only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. So if we go back to living in sin instead of uh, living in faith, we're then enemies of God, or at least we're thrown in with that group who are described as enemies of God. Uh, verse 28, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so he gets very strong in his rebuke, very strong in his encouragement of them to keep on being faithful, to keep on meeting together and encouraging each other. Uh, it is if you have trampled the Son of God underfoot. Right? What, what kinds of things do we trample underfoot? things that we don't count worthy of anything else. Right? You walk on dirt. You walk on rocks, soil. Right? So there's nothing redeemable in your relationship with Christ when you think Christ is that unworthy. You just trample him underfoot. Uh, treated the blood of the covenant that sanctified him as an unholy thing. So there's that word again in kind of two different ways. Uh, we're sanctified, we're set apart. Holy means that we're a, a, a vessel that's worthy of use, right? We've been cleansed. We're being used for something good. So he treats the blood of the covenant, that blood that Jesus shed, as an unholy thing, that it's worthless, that it, instead of being the beautiful dish, it's the paper plate. It's not important to them anymore. They count it as unholy. Um, in doing insult to the spirit of grace, and again, I don't know how far to push this, but the only unforgivable sin mentioned in Scripture is where a group of religious types are accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And Jesus says, now, every sin can be forgiven man. He even goes so far as to say, you can speak a word against the Son of Man, that is, himself. You can be forgiven for that. But no one can be forgiven for speaking against the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is the one that they're rejecting, the Word of God, the sanctifying work that the Holy Spirit has done in their life, and they count that as worthless, well, what's left? There's nothing else that God can offer them for salvation. Uh, can a person go so far that they can't come back? As long as there's repentance, there can be forgiveness. I believe that. I think what the Hebrew writer is saying is once you get to that point, it's hard to expect that there would ever be any repentance. So there's no longer any sacrifice for sin because you have trampled the Son of God underfoot, treated the covenant as unholy, and insulted the Spirit of grace. And then he finishes with that line, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To go from sanctified, holy, access to the holy of holies through the body of Jesus and end up with that phrase. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a, it's a tremendous fall. And the Hebrew writer, again, is trying to convince these Christians not to get scared, not to give up on their faith, but to keep living the life that will lead them into the holy of holies and not give up and trample the Son of God underfoot. So, uh, any questions or thoughts about that section? We're going to stop right there because verse 32 really begins, it's kind of a lengthy intro into chapter 11 where we'll be talking about that roll call of the faithful. So, we'll, Lord willing, start with verse 32 next time. I'll tell you guys bye.